today's tutorial, I am going to show you how to do lino cut printmaking or linoleum printmaking in your classroom or at home. I will show you how to take a piece of linoleum, carve into it with a variety of lino cutters to create a series of prints, whether or not you have a printing press or you're doing it by hand. If you love learning about art, hit that subscribe button so you never miss a weekly tutorial. First, I'm gonna show you the materials that you will need. And first and foremost, you need something to carve. And I love this Blick Wonder Cut Linoleum. It's so much easier to carve than the stuff we had when I was in high school, that Battleship Gray Linoleum. And essentially what you're doing is carving your very own stamp. So I have done this before with soft rubber that you can buy at craft stores for stamps as well. This is what I'm doing in my classroom, so I swear by the Blick Wonder Cut Linoleum. Then you're gonna need a sketch, or at least an idea, of what you want your artwork to be about. And I recommend doing this on a separate piece of paper. The first part of the video will walk you through my sketch, my ideas, and why I picked what I did. And if you have graphite, transfer paper, or carbon paper, you can transfer your sketch directly onto your linoleum. This makes it so much easier so you don't have to worry about erasing. This is called a bench hook, and it connects to the edge of your table and it makes your linoleum stop um, so that when you carve, you don't cut yourself. See how the linoleum hits that edge? And then you can't see this because of my camera angle. You put the other part of the bench hook on the tabletop, and then that way it stops while you're carving. This is a brayer, and it will be used to apply the ink, and I will be using Speedball Block Printing Ink. You can get away with using tempera or acrylic in a pinch, but really block printing ink does the job with all your fine lines that you're going to be carving. Speaking of carving, I'm using Speedball Lino Cutters, and these are really excellent because you can change the size of your cutters, and it has a handy storage case in the handle. Now, we're gonna take out the variety of lino cutters that we have, and I'll show you how to use these throughout the video. The first step to a successful print is planning out and sketching what you want your composition to be. I'm taking a piece of drawing paper, and I'm going to trace my linoleum block so I know exactly the proportions that my sketch needs to be. It is much easier to plan a design on paper than it is to draw directly on your linoleum. One fun option is to use graphite paper to trace images to create your composition. It depends on how comfortable you are with drawing and what your subject matter is. My theme is going to be memory, and I picked a family memory that I have of our Jack Russell Terrier, T-Bone, who used to fish down at the lake with us. I grew up on an um, eccentric lake house in South Carolina, and our family pet, T-Bone, was a fiend for fishing. He would hold a cane pole that my dad made for him in his mouth, and he actually did catch fish. It was very adorable, very fun, and just a great memory that I want to capture with this print. Now, I could draw T-Bone, uh, but this is an image that I found on the website upsplash.com. Unsplash.com, excuse me. And this is a great website for free images that are mostly royalty or copyright free, great for the classroom or in your personal art. Um, you can credit the artist um, or the photographer. And just remember with copyright laws, you wanna not just copy someone else's work or directly copy someone's image. So I'm gonna piece together this doll holding a stick um, I'm gonna change a lot about it. I'm gonna make it look like he's standing on a wooden dock and that it's a fishing pole in his mouth instead of just a stick. So planning what you want your artwork to look like is key. And with lino cuts, lines are very important. It is a work of art based on lines and shapes. So you wanna pick something that has big areas of darks, big areas of lights, and lots of lines for you to carve. You can see my graphite paper did a pretty faint tracing. I could press down harder. So I'm just going back and re-emphasizing my lines. Then I'm gonna freehand a fishing pole. Now keep in mind, if you love to draw and that's something you're very comfortable with, you can freehand this whole thing. Nothing has to be traced from a photograph. In fact, I could have texted my mom and asked her to send me a photograph of my dog. We certainly have lots of photographs of it. I just wanted to crank this video out since my students will be starting this right after spring break. Right now my composition is pretty boring. I have just a dog. I do like the diagonal of the fishing pole and that fishing line I'm gonna try and incorporate some interesting lines throughout. So I'm going to draw this wood grain to give my artwork a little bit more interest. I suggest in whatever artwork you're creating, think about line work and think about line variety. Different sizes of lines or different thickness of lines and different ways that the lines interact. Diagonal, curvy, straight, zigzag. Think back to elementary school and try and capture them all. 
I'm gonna time lapse this because you don't need to see me draw the whole thing. Um, and I am looking at images while I'm doing this. Wood grain is a motif I've used lots in my art before, so it's something I'm comfortable with and I know it's gonna be really fun to carve. As far as the fishing line, I want that to swirl around the composition and draw your eye from the dog into the wood grain and over to the top left hand corner. Once you are happy with your sketch, and this isn't a drawing tutorial, so I'm not really going into detail about the ins and outs of actually drawing it. This is more about how to carve linoleum. So transfer your drawing to your linoleum using carbon paper, graphite paper. Um, and this graphite paper that I'm using, you can see I'm drawing on the cleaner side. Um, and then I'm gonna try a ballpoint pen too to see if there's a big difference in the two. So there's my fun little smiley faces, bam! You can see the graphite pushes through when you use a drawing utensil to press into it. So you always wanna lay your carbon paper or your graphite dirty side down. So that's the side that's darkest because that has the graphite. And then I'm using painter's tape because it doesn't tear um, to kind of like wrap it like a Christmas present. This will make sure that when you're transferring your sketch, it's not gonna move all over your um, linoleum and you'll capture it accurately. Again, you could freehand directly on your linoleum if you're someone who draws a lot and is very comfortable and confident in your sketch. But for me and for my students, I like to have a plan. Linoleum carving is not really the same as drawing at all. And any mistake you make, there's no magic eraser to put the linoleum back in. So once it's wrapped like a present, you're going to take your sketch and place it where you can see it on top of your linoleum. You can see I cut it out to be the exact size and I'm using the painter's tape to make sure it's stuck to the linoleum and does not move around. You will be very familiar with your composition because the next step is you're going to retrace your composition again that way it transfers onto your linoleum. This is a time lapse. You've already seen me sketch it once. I am tracing it with a ballpoint pen because if I used a pencil, I would not be able to tell as easily which lines I've traced and which lines I haven't. Using a red pen is a really great, or blue, green, whatever color, is a great trick too because then you can really see those lines. I didn't have one laying around and I can see the difference between the pen and the pencil pretty well. Now it's time for the moment of truth. Remove all of your tracing paper and your sketch to see the design transferred. So to carve linoleum, you do need special tools, and I will be using these Speedball lino cutters um, that come with a variety of different sizes. So Speedball is a really great brand. They produce high quality products. You can definitely use off brands. Um, there's a lot of different printmaking companies out there. You can see that this has storage in the handle of the different um, blades that you will be using. Line variety is key with a successful lino cut. So using the different um, cutters that you attach to the handle, that's very important. Don't get, con uh, don't get content just using one. You're gonna want different size and shapes of lines. And so I'm gonna start out with kind of the medium one. Now here's the tricky part. To change out each of the lino cutters, you twist the top of the handle, and then you're gonna place it inside, let me zoom in here, inside where the metal is. And those two metal pieces are going to loosen up as you turn the handle to the left. If it's sitting awkwardly, try it again. You're not putting it on the outside of the circle, you're putting it on the inside. Hopefully that makes sense. So I'm gonna go ahead and start carving, and I'm going to use a medium-sized cutter first. Now here's the thing, you are using a steel blade, and you will be using force to carve. The best tool to use here is a bench hook. However, if you're like me and you have 39 students in your class or even you're doing this at home, this might be a material that you don't have or you don't have enough for everyone. One day I'll have enough bench hooks so that every student can use one. I'm gonna do this public school style and I'm gonna be taping, and my students will be taping their linoleum to the tabletop. This worked really well for me. Is it an ideal situation? Am I using the best and most expensive tools? No, I'm a public school teacher in Oklahoma so that is my solution to this problem. I am going to practice carving before I get too carried away with the details of this piece. I am going to start by carving lines in the wood grain and I'm gonna change out my blade. You'll see me do this lots of times. I recommend storing your blades in the handle even though it's easier to lay them out on the table. 
Um, if you have students like me who can't keep up with things, if you have all your blades just laying out on the table, it just, they could fall on the floor, they could get misplaced, and they are expensive. Let's try one that is more of the medium size. So I'm going to carve a line right next to the smallest gouge. And you can see that it's pretty similar, but it is a thicker line. And line variety is key with a lino cut. It's all about shape, it's all about line, it's all about contrast. So really play around with, get comfortable with switching out each of the linoleum cutters because you will be using a variety of sizes to truly get, to get those line variety or the variety of lines that really make an interesting composition. So this is one of the largest ones. This one um, I think is the size two or it might be the U-shaped one. And this creates really large areas that I will be using when creating all the white spaces in my Jack Russell Terrier. Now that we've played a little bit with the line variety, I should probably mention how to use each of the lino cutters. So you're not carving down, you're carving across. So think about like you're skiing, like so if you go water skiing, your skis don't go down into the water, they skate across the top of the surface. Um, that's kind of the same way that you're going to be using the lino cutters. Um, always, always, always cut away from yourself, which I briefly mentioned, but I want to say again, if you've ever done this before and cut yourself, you'll never forget it because you're pushing your linoleum, so you have a lot of pressure. And if you lose traction and your lino cutter jumps over the linoleum, it's gonna crash into whatever direction you're going. Hopefully that is just your tabletop, maybe your masking tape on the table. It should not be your hand or your fingers because once you've cut yourself once with a linoleum cutter, you'll remember it. I mean, it's stabbing yourself with a metal blade at a increased force because you're pressing into the linoleum. Another key concept with printmaking is your carved area stay white or whatever color you're printing on. So unlike drawing, the lines that I'm creating will not be the dark areas. So that is very tricky for the brain. This will make more sense when I do the outline of the dog. I'll kind of explain some strategies for that. As far as the wood grain, it doesn't really matter to me if the wood grain is lighter or darker. So think about that if you're doing light water or a sky. Um, it might not matter what color your lines are. However, if you want like a traditional black line, for example, the fishing pole or the outline of the dog, you have to double line it. So you would do a line on each side to create a raised surface in the center. More on that later. For the sake of timeliness, I am speeding this up to double time. So if you think I'm all of a sudden throwing caution to the wind and carving super fast, this is twice the speed I actually carved. Always carve really slowly because once you carve out that linoleum, there's really no putting it back. Also keep in mind, you're basically creating a stamp, so everything's gonna print in reverse. So these are key concepts with printmaking. The lines you're carving will avoid the ink, so anything not carved is gonna capture whatever color ink you use. You are going to be working in reverse, and this is a subtractive technique, um, so it prints as a mirror image and everything that you carve avoids the ink. We'll do a little test section in just a minute with a marker so you can kind of visualize what I mean by that. Here I go again talking about line variety and I'm gonna switch out my lino cutter and I'm gonna put in the smallest V-shaped uh, cutter. I believe it's the number one. I just go by sight. And so the reason why I did this is I wanted the wood grain to have more line variety. So some of the like more medium size line and then a really fine detail line. And that's gonna make it more interesting and give my eye more to look at. So what you see me doing is going back in between some of those thicker lines and putting a smaller, more delicate line that will really look nice when printing. I don't wanna move forward until I know I'm happy with it. So I'm gonna test by using a marker and I'm gonna color over the area that I've already carved to check my work. I feel happy and validated now that I see the really nice lines. I love the line variety and I feel like I really captured the wood grain. You can see there's a dark area where my Jack Russell Terrier's leg is. That's gonna be carved out and be completely white. So I'm doing the um, wood grain first just because I feel the most comfortable with it and I know that it's something I've done before. It's line work, but it doesn't have to be anything in particular. Where the dog, the lines have to be really careful. The wood grain could look different than how I drew it because wood grain is, you know, yes, it has a certain look to it, but it also can look different depending on each like plank of wood. So that's why I recommend starting with an area like this in your own work of art that is kind of like a no fail zone, whether it be grass or clouds or just just like background details that don't make or break the composition. 
Notice how I turned my linoleum to better work with my sense of what direction I'm carving. Um, you always carve away from yourself, and since my lines are going, if it were facing me horizontally, I'm gonna turn my linoleum so I can push up and out. That just with muscle memory makes the most sense. Um, and I can use kind of that momentum to push forward and always pushing away from myself. The tape works really well. Again, a bench hook is a great tool to use, um, but the masking tape hasn't let me down yet, and it really does make it not slide around at all. Let's kind of jump ahead since I'm repeating these same techniques using the two smallest size lino cutters for line variety, but also a really nice fine wood grain line. So I've reached a point in the wood grain where the fishing line that's cutting across is really important. I'm taking my ballpoint pen that I use for tracing and I'm sketching that line in since I kind of lost it a little bit. And the whole point of this is to kind of cut across the composition to give movement to my work of art, to give it rhythm and for my eye to kind of be directed from the face of the Jack Russell through the diagonal of the fishing pole, looping through the foreground or in front of the dog and then back into the background space. In real life, a fishing line is one of the thinnest examples of a line possible, but this is based on a memory and it's not just like an accurate, realistic representation. The wood grain is turned the wrong way, it's way too large. So I want the fishing line to really be exaggerated and really have emphasis and stand out. So I'm using the thickest of my V-shaped uh, <laughs> cutters. I'm not using the U-shaped one yet. I want it to just be a thick line, but not be like a whole thick area. So I'm using that to kind of cut through. Notice this is trickier because the wood grain nuts all kind of going the same direction, but the loops and swirls of the fishing wire, I, ha I do have to be careful when carving. So this would be a really good time to test with a marker to make sure that it is going to be the right line variety before moving on. So let me time lapse, I'm gonna finish my wood grain. And again, I'm still using the two smallest cutters. Then I'll go through and test to make sure with my marker that this area has the right amount of contrast and really stands out um, in terms of like how the fishing line cuts across. All right, let's check it out here. Let's use our marker, fill it in. And okay, I think that looks really nice. Um, I like how it cuts through. So now I'm gonna kinda turn my linoleum again and I'm gonna move on to a trickier section and focus more on the fishing pole. Now, do I want my fishing pole white or do I want my fishing pole black because I'm using black ink? And the answer is I want a little bit of both. So I'm carving out the central line um, and the reason why I'm doing this is keep in mind, the background has no detail to it. So it's gonna be pure black um, when I do my ink. So for the fishing rod to kind of cut through that, I do want it to be white, but I don't want it to just be one line. So I'm gonna zoom in and kind of show you how I double line it to give it a little bit more visual interest. When I print this on white paper, the lines I carved will be white and everything left behind is going to be black. And again, this is gonna change depending on what ink you use and what color paper you use as well. Printmaking, I have found, is one of those things you really have to see the end result before you really get it. Um, because again, you're working in reverse of what your brain is used to. We're used to when drawing a line that the line is the darkest thing, but really it's what you leave behind that's gonna capture the ink, exactly like a stamp. So I'm gonna go back through with that second to largest um, V cutter and I'm going to continue that loop of fishing line. I'm still undecided about what I want hanging from the end of the fishing line. Um, T-Bone actually caught several fish. <laughs> I thought about putting a lure on there that had some sort of significance, like a family memory, or I might just put a hook, I'm not really sure. Um, one thing with these videos is I love making them, but they're for teaching, they're for my students. They're not always to express like my best ideas. It's more about how to show a technique. So I saved the scariest part for last. You see me going back in with my ballpoint pen because I wanna have a very clear understanding about where my lines are and how thick and thin they are. Um, so it's always a good idea if you lose a little bit of your detail to go back and draw it in. Um, at this point, I've drawn it, traced it, traced it again. So tracing it is just helping my brain understand where I want everything to go. This is the scariest part because it's um, the subject of the work of art. And like I said, once you carve it, you can't get it back. So it is a little bit nerve wracking. I'm starting with my very smallest lino cutter on the nose. Now keep in mind, you have to think black and white. The nose, I wanna stay black. All the areas around of my Jack Russell Terrier will be white. 
So I'm kind of carving out around the nose. The nose will stay black. I might leave that kind of double line that I mentioned before. You'll see that more clearly when the first print is done. Um, and it is tricky to carve organic shapes because you kind of have to curl your hand around. So move your linoleum with what makes sense. You see me kind of pointing towards myself, but my hand is nowhere near the blade, I promise. I really love this small lino cutter. I think that it gives really nice small details. It's easy just to carve and carve and have these like big areas of black and white, but the line variety with this um, small cut is just really satisfying. And I can put like a small line and then go back through and carve out areas that I want white. And it's especially good for my subject matter because an animal would have fur and texture. Um, and so it really does, this small one is really great for detail work. You're gonna see my head and my hair kind of pop in the video a little bit. I was um, really aggressively carving and I was kind of standing up a little bit to get a clear view. Also, I had to keep my linoleum under the camera so you could see what I was doing. And to get to those small areas, you can see me leaning in right here. I had to lean in and just kind of really focus on the details. So please excuse my head. It pops in frame a few times. Um, you'll notice when carving, there's a lot of um, physicality to it. You're carving, it's not the same as like drawing with a line, you have to kind of press down. And keep in mind, you're not gouging down into, you should never go all the way down to the, the woven backing, <laughs> woven backing, let's get that right, of the back of the linoleum. Sometimes it happens, but again, you're not pushing down, you're skating across the linoleum for the long lines that you're creating. So I did the head first because it's important to pay attention to where your shapes intersect, overlap, and relate to each other. Because my background is so simple, it's just gonna be the color of ink that I use, I actually felt more comfortable carving these double lines around the dog because there's no interaction besides like, here's the ear, here's the background. The legs are trickier because there's like legs in the front, legs in the back. And I have all of that wood grain where I need a clear line of where the dog is, but not mess up the wood grain. So you'll see me kind of go in and kind of figure that out. I'm gonna zoom into the ears here. And this is a really good example of that double line that I was talking about and working on it currently with the tail. And so that's two lines right next to each other. There's my head again, just getting in the way. And those two lines are gonna pr provide like a black line next to a white line. And it's really great for creating emphasis. When I do my um, marker, I will show you exactly what I mean by that. So I'm moving down into the body of the dog, the area that I have to pay attention to that line. And so I wanna keep um, a white line, yes, but also that double line to create a black line as well. It's easier than I thought it would be. This is the linoleum um, wonder cut from Blick Art Materials and it really is easy to carve. Um, it holds its own, it's soft. Um, carving is just gonna always feel a little bit like a workout, so you're not gonna get away with it feeling effortless because that's not really the point. Um, and so now I'm gonna move on um, to this area of pure white, which again is scary, but because I have my double lines here, I'm more comfortable in the face and I know very clearly that that area needs to be white with an outline around it so the shape doesn't lose itself. So you really have to think shapes and you have to think lines and you have to think contrast. If it was all black, it wouldn't be interesting to look at. If it was all the same size line, it would be very boring and you don't wanna lose your shapes by losing that outline as well. Now that I did an area that I'm confident with, it's time to move down to the legs, which scare me a little bit because I don't want it to be hard to see where the legs are. And I wanna keep it simple and shape oriented without losing the, the focus of the details. So doing the outline first really helped my brain because I know I have like a clear defined line. And now I'm using my biggest cutter, which I believe is the U-shaped. Um, U-shaped number five, I think is the biggest. Um, again, I just do it by sight. And I did speed up the process. So if you think I'm going really fast and I'm gonna cut myself, remember, double time here. And I'm just gonna carve out almost a solid white area. There may be some lines that show up if I leave a little bit of space, which I like. So if you're going to be not just making it pure white and leave a little bit of lines, pay attention to the direction that your lines go. So it really helps make whatever your subject matter is look the most lifelike. Visually, I'm already feeling pretty good about it because I test the marker already. I can see like, okay, yes, that is like a lighter area. It does look like a leg, it cuts down in front. So I'm feeling good about it. I won't know for sure until I take my marker and kind of test the area. And then after that, I won't know for sure until I actually do the printing itself. 
So once you feel with each area, I recommend testing it with the marker as many times as possible. Um, that's just gonna make your carving make sense to your brain and just make it easier to see like if you're on track with what your goals are as far as your carving. I'm gonna follow my own advice to check my work often and I'm taking that same marker and coloring over the areas I've carved. So you can see the shaky line. You can see some of my, um, in those white areas, I'm gonna take the larger carver again and go back in and kind of remove some of that because this is the area of emphasis. It's the subject of the piece and my dog was white there. So I wanna make sure that's a really nice blocked out area. Hopefully it's balanced. I have the wood grain to provide kind of that area of gray. The background behind the dog is gonna be jet black. So the dog itself being white with some areas of detail of brown, I think should be a very good composition visually, a nice balance of lights and darks. You can see I'm way more confident back here because with the marker, I can see my work. Keep in mind, a marker could be messy if you don't give it enough time to dry. Um, and a permanent marker works great, but so does a washable. Um, I like the darkness of this dry erase marker just because it really shows the contrast of dark and light. So I'm gonna carve around the tail, or around the booty of my dog, and just kind of get all those details, paying attention to where the fishing, uh, fishing rod interacts with the spot, with the mouth of the dog, and so on and so forth. The legs actually really cut across the wood grain beautifully. I'm happy with that detail. I wasn't sure if it was gonna be too busy or not. Um, and I think it really does translate visually as a dog leg. Hopefully that double line and that left ear there translates. You can see how two lines next to each other actually makes that shape black. So I really like that. I think that's a fine nuanced detail, but I also want to add more. I want the ears to stand out, but also not just be jet black. So I'm gonna carve a few like little detail lines, similar to what I did in the wood grain, where you have um, more line variety. You have some of the lines being darker, well, not darker because it's white, thicker, and some of the lines being thinner. I'm gonna continue with the same concept around any area that has a line um, so any edge of the dog so around the whole body and the edge of shapes the spot the nose the ears where the mouth touches the fishing rod so I'm speeding things up again since this is a repeated skill and I really enjoy how the marker shows me exactly what areas are dark and which ones could use a little bit more carving out so that area of the spot does need a little bit more work um, and you can always test it multiple times and I've been known to do a print, wash it, dry it, do a little bit more carving and print. Again, just keep in mind if you wash it with water, it does kind of get into the linoleum and it swells it up a little bit. So I do like to avoid doing that when possible. So testing with a marker is just a really great, fast, quick way to check the progress of your work. So the photograph I used for my Jack Russell, the eyes were hard to see. So I Googled Jack Russell Terrier uh, faces and now I'm kind of looking at it on my computer screen. And I don't want the eyes to just be a simple shape so I'm just kind of going in and putting a little bit of detail and it's very clear here with the marker like what areas are going to stay dark and what are going to stay light and I'm using as you can see the smallest little cutter my friend that just gives me that beautiful fine line well he just came to life didn't he I'm going to use this same concept of the fine line and put just a few little details in the face because again it's not black it's brown I want there to be some texture I want there to be some interesting lines and again printmaking especially lino cuts it doesn't depict how something actually looks you're adding directional lines you're adding textures um, and this just gives a little bit more interest because again as you've heard me say line variety is key when it comes to lino cuts I'm gonna add a little bit more of those small lines in the um, fishing rod because although the dog is the subject and the dog is the area of emphasis, the fishing pole has a lot to do with the story that I'm trying to tell here. It's not just a picture of a dog, it's an artwork about a family memory, this beautiful moment on the dock, watch, you know, watching my dog fish, which seemed like such a cool thing as a kid. Um, so it's just a good way to remember um, something. And remember, art is storytelling. So I wanna make sure that I'm using the symbols in a way that communicates what's in my head and translate it to, to you, the viewer. You can see I'm furiously using the marker to make sure that everything looks good. And I think it's important for my brain to see it the way it's gonna print. So with that dark background, I'm really happy with the details of the dog. I was nervous about the face and the legs. So now that I have my marker I'm going to do final details and just look at my edges and make sure everything is the way I want it to be before printing. So you might have noticed that I have left the fishing line empty and there's a lot of different reasons for that. I felt like my composition would be crowded to actually have a fish on the line. My original idea was to put this little George fishing lure 
Um, this is an important detail because that's the fishing lure my dad used and he would always say drives him berserk, which is just such a part of my childhood. My dad passed away this April and fishing was just something we always did together. So to be honest, I'm procrastinating because I know that detail is like a really important part of my artwork as far as, as, far as the story I'm trying to tell, but I didn't um, want to overcrowd the composition. So I just left it simple and made it a fish hook because it tells the story without me having to dig too deep into like child childhood memories that might might not be something I want to think about today. Now for the most exciting and scary part, printing. All that hard work you put into this, the planning, the sketching, the tracing, the carving, it's time to see if it all paid off. I'm using the very low tech uh, tin foil method here. I could not find my ink tray. I don't know where it is and I wanted to get this video done today so I simply put ink on um, tin foil that I taped down. Luckily the art teacher across the hall lent me her ink roller so I'm good to go but at this moment I'm just ready to crank it out. Block printing ink works best for this and I am just going to keep it simple using black ink on a clean surface like a newspaper or extra tin foil if you're going low tech like me. You're going to roll the ink into or you're going to roll the brayer. So a brayer is the rolly tool you see me using. You're going to roll that in the ink. You want to go multiple directions. Then you're going to take the brayer, which is a hard word to say, and you're going to transfer the ink onto your linoleum. <laughs> So I turned the background, the original audio, up to 100% so you could hear that sticky sound. That is the sound you want to go for when rolling your ink. It has like a sticky sound and it kind of feels like you're rolling honey. Make sure your hands are clean. You saw my dirty thumb there. Um, and I'm going to print without using a printing press first. This is a very low tech, low key way to do it if you don't have a printing press at home or I didn't have a printing press for six years until I got back into the high school setting. Um, you can see I am furiously using my hand because your hand is the printing press. Once you've used your hand to rub the paper and have the ink transfer and you're confident that you've got all areas, all edges, it's time to pull your first print. Pull your paper with clean hands and voila, there is your print coming to life. I'm actually really happy with this one. I love that there's a little bit of grayness to it. I actually like that it's not jet black. It gives it just an interesting texture. Okay, let's do this again, but this time we're gonna re-ink our surface and I'm gonna show you how to use a printing press. Here is my printing press. After some experimentation, I have it set to 10. So depending on what you're using, you're gonna set it to a different number. I actually took the blankets out. A printing press typically comes with a blanket and the paper you see underneath my print is called the register. This helps to make sure ink stays where it's supposed to go and it helps you line up your paper. It helps you register your paper so your prints aren't crooked. What you really should do is measure your paper and draw guidelines so your prints are perfectly even every time, but uh, yeah, I didn't do that. And so I'm taking my printing press. You can see it rolling through. It's very satisfying. Look at that handle go. Printmaking and the printing day is one of the most fun days in an art class. Have to kind of make the printing bed. I'm encouraging it to go forward a little bit. Pulling my print, check him out. Look how dark and bold that print is. A couple things you can do to control the ink is if you think there's too much ink, put less on the next time. And it does take practice and experimentation. Or you can um, change the numbers on your printing press. So if you adjust the handles, it makes it either a tighter or a looser fit. And every printing pr press is a little bit different. Block printing, um, you definitely want it to not press down too much because then it will fill in your lines. So practicing with that is key. Final print will be a ghost print. And a ghost print is where you run it through the printing press or by hand a second time without re-inking your surface and it should be a fainter lighter print because you've already printed once. Okay, this is maybe the best ghost print I've ever created. Look how fine and clean the lines are. That's actually how I wanted it to look. I think the first print, maybe I had too much ink on it or I should say the second print, I either had too much ink on it or perhaps um, I had it set a little too tight where the press pressed into the ink a little bit too much. Well, that was fun. Now that I have three prints, let's set them next to each other and kind of compare them and talk about how to sign a print. 
So you're gonna always put the additions on the left-hand side. So I put three, or I, I printed three prints. This is one out of three. I'm titling it T-Bone, then I'm signing my name and putting the date over to the right. Did the same thing on my other one, but you might notice it's two out of three because that's my second print. Looking at these, it's really hard to pick my favorite. I actually like the first one better. I like the gray, it captured enough detail, but this one I think I kind of lost some of the detail of the dog's head. Maybe the ghost print's the best one because it isn't so stark black and white, but all my lines are visible. Yellow is my favorite color, so maybe that's why I like this one too. Three out of three. T-Bone is the title. The artist is Sierra Machado, so I'm putting S Machado there. And I simply put a 22 because I printed these in the year 22. Wait, the year 2022. So there's my yellow ghost print, printing press number two, and my first print by hand. Thank you so much for sticking around and making art with me. And if you're interested in more tutorials, check these out. Find me on Instagram at thatartteacher underscore Machado to see what my students are up to in my classroom. And find my website, thatartteacher.com for full length examples, lesson plans, rubrics, and everything out of my cluttered classroom.